Okay, here's the thing. I've made this video in a way loads of different times in other videos. I've mentioned this and talked about it so many times, but there still seems to be a lot of confusion between the iGPUs and dedicated GPUs. And if you've got one, do you need the other? Basically, I'm getting way too many comments for me to be happy that I have provided enough information for those people to make the right decision. And I'm seeing a lot of weird benchmarks that a lot of big YouTubers make on the internet that kind of makes this even more confusing. So let's talk about this one last time and then clear this out of the way. Looking for a cheap way to license your windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. One of the most common comments that I still get in my IGP versus DGPU videos is that if I've got an RTX 3090 or 3070 or like a big graphics card, do I still need the iGPU on, you know, the Intel processors like the, you know, why do I go with the K variant? Why don't I go with the KF variant? Because I'll be paying extra for an iGPU that I don't need, right? And this is what frustrates me because this is like a very wrong way of seeing it. You're just gonna waste your money because buying the iGPU like the K variant or the non-F variant will give you the best GPU performance or purchase that you have paid for like a five or ten dollars. It's ridiculous. In a moment I'm going to show you a benchmark comparison between iGPU enabled and disabled so you can actually see how much an iGPU makes a difference even if you have an RTX 3090. But before that I want to make a little bit of a clarification of some of the actual benchmarks that we're seeing online some other big YouTubers making. So if you watch the CPU reviews from like the big YouTubers you know I'm not gonna name any names, but I'm sure you can name a few of them. Then often what I have noticed is when they are running their benchmarks, I'm looking at my benchmarks and I'm thinking, why is mine so much higher? Like we're running the same configuration, you know, Intel sends the same stuff to both of us, you know, like the, the same CPU, we've got the same GPU, but my benchmarks are way higher than theirs. Like what kind of secret sauce am I running? And then I'm realizing that often in their benchmarks, what happens is they don't enable the iGPU on the benchmarks because they're mostly gaming oriented or they're, they're gaming focused and when they run the productivity benchmarks like Premiere Pro especially Premiere Pro then they think you know dedicated gra graphics card is good and we don't need to enable the iGPU because it might actually you know disable some of the performance of this big GPU this is wrong really or this is a little bit of a like an old school thinking how to run benchmarks Basically, with the latest 12th gen and even 11th gen and 10th gen, the latest software, Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve, especially as a video editor, those programs can run both of these GPUs at the same time, and they're smart enough to know when to use one and when to use the other. And even though the iGPU inside the Intel CPUs is not powerful in terms of graphics calculating or graphics processing performance. What the iGPU is extremely good at doing is encoding and decoding some of the footage that even the NVIDIA RTX 3090 can't do. So even if you have an RTX 3090, enabling this iGPU is gonna give you extra performance that you're gonna just not get from the graphics card. The graphics card has the encoders, the NVENC video encoders and decodes inside the graphics card. So you might be thinking, I don't need any more of those, but the thing is, at the moment, the latest and greatest of NVIDIA encoders inside aren't as good as the Intel iGPU encoders inside the CPU. So to me, it makes zero sense for you to go and buy a KF or an F variant of the Intel CPUs thinking that this encoder over here is gonna be fine. Why don't you have both? And the price difference between a KF or the F variant and the K variant is gonna be marginal, like maybe $5, sometimes even less than that. So the encoders that you can buy for these for just a few bucks are just the best purchase you can ever make. So please, one last time, do not make the mistake of buying an F variant as a creator of those CPUs. Now, I've made a complete another video about the F variant of CPUs. I'm gonna go more in detail, like why for some of the other workflows it is more important. But in this video, I really wanna show you some of the benchmark differences, how 
big of a difference the iGPU makes inside there. So if you look on the screen over here right now, I'm going to show you these graphs one last time why this is such a good thing, especially if you're in DaVinci Resolve. So looking on the left side over here, you can see the supported codecs on different you know, systems. You can see the NVIDIA RTX 3000 series graphics cards, which you have over here, and then the Intel QuickSync, which is you know, the iGPU inside the 11th, 10th, and 12th gen. If we go to the H.265, the high efficiency codec, then you can see that the NVIDIA RTX 3000, this is DaVinci Resolve over here that we're looking at, only supports like few of them, but look at the 11th of 12th gen, Intel ones, they support everything of H.265. So why wouldn't you want that? Let's say you're working with 8-bit 422 H.265 footage, your NVIDIA graphics cards are gonna go, uh, we can't do anything. Why wouldn't you want an iGPU inside there to just say, no problem, and your timeline performance is gonna be buttery, buttery smooth. The same is going to go with 10-bit 422, which is a very, very normal everyday codec that you can find in a mirrorless camera. Look, NVIDIA graphics card, they can't play this back natively or accelerated by hardware. Into the quick sync, 11th and 12th gen, no problem. Now, if you're looking at this on Premiere Pro over here, this is not as big of a difference, but still a huge difference on the 11th and 12th gen. And I would still purchase the iGPU because we're just waiting for Adobe to actually make the update and utilize the hardware on their software because we know that DaVinci Resolve can do it. So that means that the encoders inside the iGPU can do it. So please just buy the iGPU because it's not going to be so much more expensive, but so, so good. As you can see, 10-bit 422 NVIDIA RTX here can't do it, but 11th and 12th gen can do it so it's going to be a huge difference so let's have a look at some of the benchmarks here then so i've done two benchmarks over here in premiere pro budget bench let's have a look at the actual hardware first on the left side we have the uhd igpu enabled on the intel side in this pc that we have over here oh if you haven't seen the build of this pc mwah, it's beautiful go check it out small form factor 12900k rtx 3090 <laughs> power and then on the right side over here we have the same system but just the igpu disabled as you can see we have only the rdx 3090 but on here video card we have the uhd 770 the only thing we're changing is enabling and disabling the igpu inside the processes and that's basically the f variant because that's the cpu that doesn't come with the igpu and then having non-f variant whether it's with a K or without the K in the end, and then there is an iGPU inside there. On the right side is without the iGPU, and then on the left side we have with an iGP enabled. And look at the differences in the standard overall score and even extended overall score. That is a huge difference. Now, depending on some of the benchmarks I'm running, I might be bottlenecked in like RAM or some other configuration, but I have seen this even a more or even bigger difference. I have seen this like probably up to 40% difference. This over here is running only 32 gigabytes of RAM, which most likely is gonna cap the live playback speed because when you're live playbacking, you're using a lot of RAM. With the iGPU, we can get an even bigger difference because I have seen the standard playback with the iGPU going like over 200 and reaching 220 over here. So as you can see, the standard live playback, as you can see, 193, 107. We're reaching like close to having double the performance in your live playback score. And extended live playback score, very similar story over here. 89.1 and 141.8. But even the extended export score, as you can see over here, we're just quite a bit better than without the IGP. That's basically because even the IGPU can do some of the encoding of your video timeline if you're exporting or doing stuff like that, which is just huge. Now bear in mind, the difference is mainly when we're working with H.264 and 5 codecs. But regardless, whatever you're doing, it's just good to have the iGPU there. It doesn't take any performance away from this over here. I know you can see that the FX score is lower, but this can be just a margin of error because my FX score with the IGP and a different, you know, because I only ran this once rather than doing like an average of different tests, but this even shows the difference. So I've got no problem showing you this because the point I'm making is that there's a huge difference between those two. Especially if you are editing mirrorless camera codecs, H.264 and 5, it's going to be absolutely huge. Having the iGPU enabled is going to give you loads of performance. I have I made myself clear yet? Please don't make this mistake. Now looking at DaVinci Resolve benchmarks over here, 
you can see exactly the same on the left side UHD enabled on the right side just RTX 3090 everything else is the same but now looking at the scores we're like very similar like within the margin of error for both of them and here's the thing because how the Puget Systems benchmark runs on DaVinci Resolve it doesn't use a lot of H.265 codecs feel free to go check out my previous video why Intel is so much better on DaVinci Resolve I'm showing you there that if I'm using H.265 codecs like different codecs DaVinci Resolve program is so clever that it can just utilize the encoders on either the graphics card or the iGPU depending like which plays it back better and it can just switch which one it works but having the iGPU on DaVinci Resolve is still gonna make a huge difference it's just because this benchmark doesn't use a lot of H.265 codecs which doesn't make a big difference just show, looking at these benchmark scores but in real world timeline performance if you're using H.265 codecs then there's gonna be a huge difference. So then, please show this video to someone who's already commenting, or if you've seen some of these comments, should I go with the KF CPU? Because, you know, I already have a very powerful graphics card. Just help them out, post this video link to them, or to your friends who think, do you know what, I'm gonna go with the KF CPU because it's gonna be cheaper. You know, I'm gonna save $20 in there. Oh, please don't make that mistake. That $20 is gonna be the best $20 you've spent on an iGPU when your client says, look, I've got some mirrorless camera footage here from a Canon R5, H.265, you know, 10 bit 422. Uh, let's just edit it. And you're going to be like, yeah, no problem. Can you just wait for me? Because uh, I'm going to make some proxies because I can't play it back. But having the IGPU, you're going to be like, all done smooth okay hope this is clear thanks guys for watching let me know what you think in the comment section below if you have any other questions i'll meet you down there and if you haven't seen this pc yet this beast of a small pc go check it out bye bye